Hello, and thank you for tuning in, everyone. I am FBI Tugboat, play-by-play -play caster, who will be doing today's intro to Overwatch shoutcasting class. With me, as always, is HX9. HX, how we doing? Oh, I'm doing great today, Tugboat. I'm glad to be here with uh, yet HX, another... HX, you there with me? Yeah, I'm here. Glad to be okay, here. Sorry like, about that. Uh, so this is uh, this is an intro to Overwatch shoutcasting class. Um, I'll go ahead and just speak about myself for a while. Um, I'm a shoutcaster. Been uh, let's. I, I uh, went my entire life going to traditional sports games and listening to announcers and thinking about how just absolutely cool that was. But then telling myself that you know my voice sucked or that I'd stutter over everything for a you know large majority of my life. I've had a mild stutter that shoutcasting has actually helped tremendously with. Um, and I wouldn't, so I wouldn't say stuff that, uh, that people would find interesting was another, you know, big concern of mine. So I just stuffed that desire deep on down, didn't do anything with it. Went up to college and got a degree in a side interest marketing. It has helped me a lot in my professional life, but didn't really give me that same, uh, level of satisfaction by any means. All that changed when uh, some people I was cool with started running an esports center, hosted a Fortnite tournament, and I just said, screw it, I'm going to go for it. And I did it through Insecurity of the Wind. And uh, for the first time in my life, just absolutely disregarded what others thought about my voice or, you know, whatever else. And then I did. And my hair stood on end for seven hours. I reached what a lot of people would call the zone or level of zen or whatever else you want to call it. And next thing I knew, my co-caster and a good uh, friend of mine, Bobby, was asking me if I had collected my things because it was time to leave. Um, shoutcasting is just an amazing experience. And I've been chasing that since. It's just absolutely incomparable to other experiences in my life. And uh, I have a very different experience, of course. I'm HX9. Uh, you can see me there. You call me Bob. Most people do. <laughs> Actually, surprisingly few people call me that in Overwatch, but pretty much every <laughs> other game, everyone calls me Bob and not by my username here. But uh, I have a little bit of experience with casting, of course. I've done casting for Blizzard uh, in the 2016 Hearthstone, America's Spring Preliminaries, and some TESPA tournaments as well. Uh, in terms of experience gaming, I've been playing games since I was three years old, and that's a long time ago, longer than probably some of you uh, would expect, <laughs> so about 30 years of gaming. So I'm an Overwatch Grandmaster, Hearthstone Legend, WoW Gladiator, uh, I've been Master in StarCraft II, and there's tons of other games I've played too, a lot of platformers and whatever else, so I'm pretty much a generalist. I understand some of you are coming mm -hmm. from some other games too, where you might also be generalists and want to learn a little bit more about Overwatch specifically. Specifically. So no, that's one of our goals today. In terms of my mm -hmm. professional background, uh, uh, I, I, am, uh, I work in computer field right now for my day job. Uh, I was actually a music education major when I uh, graduated through college. And I've done a lot of public speaking. The most people I've performed in front of live uh, would be 3,000 uh, doing a uh, solo in that case and uh, uh, some group work as well and uh, in terms of the blizzard event 75,000 concurrent which is not not as many as a lot of the overwatch league casts are getting too so uh, you know it's it's a little short of that but uh, it's pretty up there so I've got a lot of experience in the field and public speaking I've never never been scared of it so and I'm also the one running the slides here so when you see things going wrong don't blame tugboat here you, you know it's probably going to be me <laughs> a worthwhile a worthwhile statement here um let's see yeah I, I have also played games for a super long time up here uh did something with aoe sports recently some australian contenders teams played in that one uh, a live event i did with the south the southeastern gaming exchange where there was a big old Fortnite tournament big old overwatch tournament and that was just uh, that was another, another one that i did with a buddy, a buddy of mine bobby great co-caster so uh we're going to go into the outline of how this class is going to go basically we're going to be uh, trying to get you guys the entire idea of shoutcasting from beginning to end. Um, there'd be lots of tips and tricks and all the other stuff in there that I have learned that I would like, you know, would have liked to have known at the beginning of my shoutcasting career. Um, and, uh, and all of this will be divided up between, you know, me and HX. Uh, we're going to take a couple breaks. Uh, Jaws will come in towards the end. Jaws being a huge contenders caster in EU. Great guy, huge play-by-play -play guy. Um, and he's going to answer some questions uh, from me, and then if you guys have any questions from you guys. At the end, we'll, we're going to pair you guys off based on role preference for play-by-play -play and color, and then have you guys cast over a VOD for about 10 minutes, muted so that you, know, you can't hear the commentary and stuff. Afterwards, for the next week or so, we'll be reviewing those and getting back to you, either posting them 
in uh, the uh, the way of the Tug Discord channel or sending it to you directly, whichever you guys would kind of prefer. Um, how we're going to do questions, basically, is if there is a, if you guys didn't hear, if there is just a monumental question that, you know, is foundational to understanding what we're doing, then please put it in chat. Otherwise, uh, you know, we try and like to keep chat as even as possible. And, uh, and at the end of each segment, I will ask, hey, is there any questions? And we'll open it on up, answer, uh, answer that, and then keep it moving. Uh, part of anything is shout outs. So this class is sponsored by Virtual Reload, an esports coaching center up in Greenville, South Carolina, which of course is in sponsorship with Erskine College. Erskine College is the only college in South Carolina uh, to provide esports scholarships. Uh, I believe Brandon Oberly, the head coach, is talking to see a young man give himself a big old scholarship offered uh, this upcoming week, and they're filling the program, uh, and they were super interested in this. So that's why they went ahead and sponsored it. EGN, Everlife Gaming Network. Great guys, Jared Kaiser. Shout out to him. Without him, this class would not be happening by any means. Um, showed a lot of interest in it. EGN is a production organization with a lot of casters from some other games. I believe Rainbow Six and League of Legends. Not 100% sure on that. But uh, but this class really happened because of them. And again, I appreciate that, guys, um, and, and the interest initially that you know created this class. Um, and there's a long message in the in the channel about this, about Erskine College. But if you guys want to know anything about Erskine College and their esports teams, just DM me after the class, and I will answer as, uh, all the questions you guys got. Awesome. Let's see. Yep, and we'll just uh, we'll just hop right in, unless you got something, Bob. Uh, nothing to add right now. I'll be back a little bit later. We're gonna start off with Tugboat here. He's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, you know what is Overwatch? You know, what is this game we're playing? And why do people do these kind of things? Why do people do esports? Why do people do esports? What a question. Competition. I would put it in one word. HX. Humans have evolved at the top of the food chain by competition. It's just a natural part of life, part of evolution, other things like this. You know, in the past. We have used these aggressions to gather food, procreate, uh, claim territory, other things like this, and we are, you know, uh, 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 you know, we're, we are sane, uh, humane individuals now. We have, we still have some of these urges, and a lot of times these are put into sports and other competitions as healthy outlets. Now, why do esports exist? Esports exist because sports existed. You know, you could say that pong was the first video game ever, and that's basically hockey, hockey slash, you know, kind of soccer. Esports competitions came around from sports. And of course, they double as entertainment. Um, many people know, for, just to draw a parallel here, many people know about uh, the, the new NFL rules. Obviously, the NFL Professional Football League being the, one of the bigger uh, traditional sports exhibitions, a lot of huge source of entertainment in America, and how they're kind of changing some of the rules now. So there's a you know, big old pa rough in the past rule that I'm not going to get into that a lot of people are upset about that is being implemented for the safety of the players. But as far as an entertainment side, it is not the best for production value. People are upset about it. People don't understand it. Now, the parallel I'd like to draw is to esports and how they have patches come out every two weeks, month, you know, every Tuesday for Overwatch where they can, where they can make things better. Okay. Uh, and and that, that is just a perfect correlation to draw, a parallel, excuse me, to draw between traditional sports and esports. Well, again, esports coming from those. Moving forward here. So some similarities and differences to casting Overwatch versus other games. Now, Overwatch is extremely fast-paced, just like other FPSs. You know, Overwatch is a squad-based FPS, meaning there's a relatively large team. Each player has a role in the squad. Uh, Overwatch, you know, specifically has 28 different heroes, three main roles between tanks, supports, or damages slash DPS, very similar to other games. So like first-person shooters, you know, there's lots of snipers, headshots, skill aiming, stuff like that. Skill shots are something that you're super hyped up to get the crowd going. That is, that is prime play-by-play -play material. And that Widow hits that perfect headshot across map on a, you know, a support or a main tank or something else like this to get them all the way down or take them out, charge other, uh, charge other team, you know, 10, 15 seconds, make them reset. Uh, as far as roles, you know, they, uh, they share that with a lot of MOBAs, you know, squad-based. There's a lot of players, usually more than four, or, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, they have cooldowns. Everything is, is based on objectives, not necessarily based on kills. And teamwork is essential and very easy to comment on as a caster. Okay. Um, very similar to real-time strategy games, you know, StarCraft, all that. And they're very fast reactions. You have to be quick to keep up with things, uh, although there, you know, might not be as, uh, as many clicks and, and actions as, uh, you know, real-time strategy as Overwatch. 
And just like the new wildly popular format Battle Royale, there's an extremely harsh punishment of mistakes. And I think that anybody who's played a little Fortnite or PUBG can agree with me here after making, you know, one small little error and then taking out in, you know, 20 minutes of your life wasted. Moving on to some differences. Unlike a lot of the uh, first person shooters, roles can really complicate things. Um, not everyone can do everything. Uh, one, uh, a one versus six, for example, is practically impossible, and this won't stop some DPS players from doing it and, and gain Overwatch now. But in other games like, say, Gears of War or Halo, those, that skill level really comes into play, and it is possible to take out you know, many, many players on the other team. That is generally not possible in Overwatch. Let's see. Unlike MOBAs, massive online battle arenas, um, the, with, uh, you know, MOBAs have that big aerial view. You know, the huge team fights that allows casters to see everything, and of course, a third-person camera is possible from Overwatch, but not that high up. Um, unlike real-time strategies, again, kind of the aerial view and real-time strategies generally have less players than Overwatch. Obviously, the more players you have, the harder that it is to keep up with everything. Um, and unlike Battle Royale, losses in Overwatch generally come in predictable uh, steps. You know, uh, in, in a control point or 2CP, for example, uh, you know, you would lose a first point and then you have a second chance on the second one. In fact, something that a defending team would have a better chance of defending. So it's not just one mistake, you get unlucky, or, or you may do something dumb and you die out, bam, that's it. Uh, Overwatch is a little bit more consistent. Let's see. And after that one, and we will go on to, oh, I guess we'll open up to questions on this one. If anybody's got anything, give it a couple seconds here. Cool. Perfect. Um, moving, uh, moving forward here. Things that things that are needed, absolutely needed. 100% can't uh, can't cast Overwatch without it. A PC, and of course, um, there is some Xbox, PlayStation stuff we'll get into. But generally, and and as a general rule, competitive games are played on PC. Um, just going through the list here. Obviously, you need a headset and a microphone to pick up what you're saying. A paper and a pencil. Uh, you need the game Overwatch, obviously, and some sort of chat program. Um, obviously, you know, other stuff to, that you need to cast is a game or a match to cast through an organization that's having scrims or some other sort of tournament and knowledge about the game of Overwatch. Some other things here that are that will help you in your experience of casting. Um, something that I do is folding index cards and putting kind of over the top of the various, uh, of either side for teams. Sometimes they can switch around and, and me personally, I get mixed up sometimes. Something that HX does, for example, is using the Epic Pen app on the on the uh, on the computer to write, you know, over on the top. Obviously, you can you know erase it, use highlight it, all that other stuff. Um, and, and it's just you know two different things. I'm just more of a you know physical uh, physical learner when I write stuff. Uh, better equipment in general. You know, there's never going to be a uh, there's never going to be a, a time where anybody can say that having a better processor, having a better graphics card, or having something, or having a better X is not going to make for better Overwatch. Being able to see, being able to hear, being able to you know in, in immerse yourself in the game more is going to make for a better shoutcasting experience. And just in general, playing more Overwatch. And of course, uh, casting is part of that. Something personally that I do that might sound a little bit lame, and that is A-OK, -okay, but especially when I've been able to cast a lot when I'm driving my car, I'll cast the things around me. And we're going down Garners Ferry Road now, right behind a red Toyota, stuff like that. And again, it might be a little bit lame, that's A-OK. -okay. It, uh, it, it helps me keep into practice, uh, especially, again, when I haven't gotten to, haven't gotten to cast anything for a while. Um, and just in general, people who love the eSport are going to do better. Um, that's just, a, I, I think that is a wide assumption, wide statement that you could make about any game and almost any experience. Right, and on that note, yeah. it's important to note that you know, if you watch professional football or basketball, the announcers on the side aren't out there, you know, making the, you know, th making shots from half court and, you know, dunking on people. They aren't even tall enough in some cases. And, you know, you, you've seen John Madden. That guy's huge, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and he's also a great meme. But, uh, you know, you don't have to be world class at games, but you do have to understand the nuance. So that's one of the most important uh, pieces mm -hmm. there in terms of recommendations for hardware got that question in the chat here uh, honestly the best thing you can have is a, any kind of pc that would run overwatch at, at least 30 fps for casting but if you really want to be a player of the game and advance to the point where i think you're going to get the most knowledge i think you want to have something that can run it at 60 
and that's not really a tall order. You can get a number of gaming laptops even for under $600 that will run it. And I'll actually, when we get to a certain point later, I'll actually put a link in the chat that goes to a site that I use personally to help recommend people laptops that are great for, for, uh, for especially for casting. And remember, having that mobile, that mobility on your desktop or on your casting machine actually can help quite a bit. Uh, you don't need a whole lot of... Uh, you don't need a whole lot of equipment to run for casting, but, you know, again, playing the game, it's very important. But with that, uh, I think I'll I'll take over from here, uh, Tugboat here. I'll get the next mm -hmm. section under my, under my wing here. And that take is, her away. you know, uh, let's talk about UI elements. Uh, what do you actually need to cast from inside the game? You need to see things. You need to be able to hear things. There are certain parts of the game that we're going to point out here that are specific to Overwatch. This is what you're going to be looking at to get information. Remember, information is the key into... Uh, how you cast. If a play-by-play -play caster is translating the information into a series of what's, a color caster is taking that same series of information and translating it into why's or how's or when did something happen and what was the effect of it. So there's a little bit of nuance there in how to, to interpret any of these particular elements in the game. There are also non-UI elements, and those are things you can't see in-game. They're things you're going to draw upon in order to also formulate that cast, formulate that picture of what's going on, the, your word painting in a lot of ways here. And so uh, I'm going to take you into the game here, and we're going to see some of those elements with big bright pointers on them so you kind of see what's going on inside of a game. This is your uh, free camera view. This is something that you're going to want to utilize the majority of the time as a caster. You should not be jumping into other views a whole lot. The camera, though, that you're going to be watching, it's going to be jumping all over the place. It's going to go to some third person, some third person. Uh, so you can't really just watch the stream and cast. This is giving you that ability to control what you actually see. And not everyone gets that, keep in mind. A lot of other professional games and whatever else, will not. you won't necessarily get this. Uh, this isn't always the case, though. When you're doing something live, you may not have access to your own machine to fly around in. You may have to rely on what is provided to you when it comes to uh, the cast. For Hearthstone Spring preliminaries, I could see the Hearthstone screen completely. I didn't really have to hover over anything, but what if I really couldn't see one of the cards or didn't recognize the picture on it? Well, I'd, I'd be a pretty much an amateur there. I, I know all the cards in Hearthstone, but, <laughs> but the point is, sometimes you can't see uh, everything that you want to see just from the broadcast. And so what you're going to want to do is uh, check out other things like uh, inside the cast from your own perspective. So we got health bars at the top of the screen. You're always going to see this up there, even if you're in first person view. And that is going to show you just exactly how much health they have. A couple things to call out for, that are Overwatch specific and something that you need to know the difference between is what the different colors of health mean. Each health mm -hmm. bar uh, color has a different meaning. Regular health is white. Uh, the blue is shields. So health is just regular health. Shields are something that replenishes after a character is not in combat for a while. So Zarya can replenish half her health, as you can see in the top left corner there. Uh, she can replenish half her health, 200 health out of 400, uh, without just as long as she's out of combat. She doesn't need a healer to do that. Zenyatta, of course, can replenish three quarters of his health, 150 hit points. Uh, but we also have yellow health. You see that on Bastion there. Yellow health is armor. Armor has a very crazy mechanic. And I'm going to do a little math for you here, folks. Armor <laughs> takes... 5 damage maximum off of an attack. But otherwise, if it's less than that, it would be because it's half the damage of the attack. So if you do 20 damage to someone normally, armor will reduce that to 15. If you do 3 damage normally, it'll do 1.5 damage to the armor on the target. Where would this come important? If you're doing a really nuanced cast or saw some first person work on Hearthstone and your other camera, and uh, you saw he was punching a lot. Well, it turns out Winston punches do 30 damage, as do all quick melee attacks in Hearthstone. Or Hearthstone in Overwatch. Yeah, I'm getting my wires crossed there. <laughs> but uh, that means that a punch would be 25 damage. Winston's regular Tesla cannon does, and that's over uh, half a second, mind you. And punch mm -hmm. refreshes every second. Winston's Tesla cannon, however, does 60 damage per second. So it'll do the same damage as two punches in the same amount of time. Uh, if you could punch twice, you can't punch twice, though. So usually it'll do half Tesla cannon, half melee punch. To, uh, that's a nuanced Winston thing, as you should know. 
And what that means is that if Winston's attacking an armored target, if he's punching, he's doing that extra bit of damage. He's doing actually an extra 10 damage in that second period. So instead of doing 30 damage, he's doing 40 damage. So if you were observing a Winston, you were seeing him punch a lot, you might say, well, he's punching a lot because he's doing that against armored targets. That might be something you pick up. Or, oh, that Winston was trying to attack that Reinhardt. That Reinhardt has 200 armor, and he wasn't punching at all. Had he punched, he would have gotten a little bit more damage. That might be a way to separate that Winston from a much more uh, skilled Winston. Some other things you're going to see on the UI breakdown, of course, are alt charges. Characters in Overwatch build ultimate by doing damage and healing. They don't build it by taking damage, as they do in some other games that you might know about. And they also don't build it by doing damage to a non a non-lethal damage in a sense. So it, so if it's to a shield, it's not going to deal to build any uh, alt charge, but not to be confused with the health shields. They're kind of different kinds of shields in the game. They're barriers as they're called. People call them interchangeably shields, which might confuse you. A barrier is just a big old wall that Reinhardt puts up, a bubble that Winston puts up. There's a lot of different projected shields that are not attached to a character and some attached shields also like Zarya's projected barriers uh, Winston's bubble of course is not attached it's detached but Hammond's shield uh, wrecking ball shield also it's a big shield that goes out there so uh, th there's a lot of different things that don't cause all charge and you're going to need to know the difference between those and of course you see the map information surrounded in black there that's the, what the objective is for the team you're currently observing. It'll say stop the payload or escort the payload on a payload map. It'll say capture the objective on other maps or it'll say defend the objective on some. And the time base, and the time there too. You're going to want to know the specifics about time. Four minutes for an assault on a two, two capture point map, an assault map. They get an extra four minutes when they get to the next point. They get 30 extra seconds in, in extra rounds if it comes to. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you should go and learn those things. Health bars on top of players are not activated by default. You need to actually set the hotkey to turn these on every game before you go into a game of Overwatch. So be sure to go into your hotkeys and set that hotkey so that you can turn these on every cast. It's very important to have those there. It's a lot easier to be looking right in the center of the screen instead of looking in the top left and top right corners constantly. All right, let's move on to the next one here. And that is the main overview. And you'll see this is hard to kind of observe. And I intentionally picked this scene to show if you're observing in first person, you're going to be missing quite a bit. But there are some elements of the game you can only see in first person. One of those things would be the team name of that specific hero and the player name. Sometimes the overlays that a producer is going to be using are going to show the team name and you won't have access to it easily. If you want to avoid going to the lobby, Zoom, zoom in on a player. Their team name should be right there, provided that they've been filled in. Also, the player name will be there as well. That can help you out a little bit, but player names at the top of your screen, you'll see that there's Zenyatta 2, Lucio 2, Zarya. That's just because the player names for these bots that I used to take these screenshots were just the bot names, which are the character names. So you're not going to get the hero names. The only way to get the hero names is to know the hero portraits. So you have to know Lucio's portrait is the guy, with the you know, the black guy with the green goggles, and Zenyatta's the robot with many eyes with the yellow chin on his portrait. <laughs> so uh, this is an important thing to note. But some things that you really need to see in this, and you'll see in the bottom right corner, you're gonna have to squint, maybe even zoom in on your browser there, ammo and cooldown. So if you're having a question of, hey, why didn't Zarya use a barrier on that Winston when he dived in? Let's check. Oh, Zarya's cooldown was still up. She still had three seconds left before that projected barrier came up. And I know that's an eight second cooldown because I've done my studying of Overwatch. So uh, <laughs> that means that five seconds ago, she used it on somebody. I wonder who that was. Can I remember? Oh yeah, she used it on this. Now you can paint a picture as a color caster, for example. Or if you're a play-by-play -play caster, maybe you bring that up too. You know, it's, you're not necessarily limited to that. Zarya's bubble's coming up and there it is. They're mm -hmm. going to dive in with that cooldown. Ammo. Another thing you might be checking in, if you want to nuance, uh, let's give a little nuance about what's going on. Hey, you know, McCree ran out of ammo as he was firing, so he wasn't able to finish a shot. Shouldn't have used his flashbang there. Never flashbang without some ammo in the chamber, you know. That might be something that you say. In the center of the screen, you're going to see the crosshair is completely covered up, and this is almost always the case, but there is Zarya's energy right there. Some heroes have specific UI elements in their crosshair that will show what's going on. You can disable this, of course, if you are not a very savvy Overwatch player by changing your own reticle. So you want to be careful about that uh, when you're doing cast, not to obfuscate any of the information. But you can see she has 25 energy there, and Zarya deals more damage the more energy she has. She builds his energy by taking damage through barriers. 
if you know that, then you know that she's only taking a little bit of damage here. So it's an important thing to note. Mm -hmm. But finally... No. Uh, finally, we're going to go into other non-UI elements. Nerf this! There you go. There's one of them right there. Diva's bomb! You know, nerf this! Being shout out there. You're going to have to use more than just your eyes because Overwatch is a game of I work every day on the front lines of the addiction crisis. Oh, hey, there you go. YouTube's continuing on there. But uh, you're going to see it's a game of 6v6, and that means that uh, you're not always going to have everything in frame. You're going to have to listen for things going on off screen because there might be many micro battles going on, and you're not going to be able to capture everything with just your eyes. So using sound is very important. You know, Anna, for example, ah, you look tired. You know, she says that whenever she lands a sleep dart. So you don't even have to hear the sleep dart sound, which is just the kind of thunk and the landing of it, which is a kind of downplaying sound. I, I know I'm such a great sound effect guy, right? Yeah, you wouldn't see me on police, uh, uh, police academy <laughs> movies here, but uh, <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, you know, and also gunshots, you can hear those too. You can hear when there's a battle going on somewhere else that maybe not in that's not in frame. Also, gunshots even in frame. Actually, we're gonna go back up real quick uh, to one of the other ones that I wanted to back up to, and that is this screen right here. You can see Zinyata's orb in the center of the screen that he shoots out his primary fire. It's a projectile, and it does make that big of a flash on screen. That's basically a frame right there. It's not always showing all those positions in frame. But you can see that Zenyatta has uh, that kind of projectile. You can see Zarya's beam shooting out. So even using those, using the bullet indicators to see where people are aiming can help you with the regular UI elements. But also you got the knowledge. You need to bring the knowledge to the cast. And that means reading up on Wikipedia entries. How do I know Winston's gun's called the Tesla cannon? You know, do you know what Diva's you know, little gun is when she's out of her mech. Do you know what it's called? You don't need to know that level of detail, okay? But it can help add flavor to the cast if you do know it. So it's very important uh, to know a lot of the ability names and whatnot too. We'll get into why that is a little bit later, especially for color casters. Finally, we're looking up VOD, strategies, meta reports. Do you know what the current st uh, state of the game is? Do you know what's coming up next? Reddit, read up on that, hot topics. So for example, this team might be running a Farah. Why are they running a Pharah? Gosh, Pharah was a terrible hero. Well, did you read about the balance patch that just came out? She's firing a heck of a lot faster now. She also can boop herself around a little bit more with her, do you know what it's called? Concussive Blast. That's her okay. knockback ability. If you don't know it's called Concussive Blast, you're missing out on favor. You might just call it a knockback. There are a hundred different knockbacks in the game. You need to know which each one of them is, which each one of them is called. Finally, you're going to talk about the Yomi. And this is something you build as you play games and as you watch games. And that's knowing what's in your enemy's mind before they know it or even before you would <laughs> see it. So Yomi is a... Yomi is a... Uh, a basically it's it's a term that a lot of competitive people use so you can build this by having experience of course but also you have to know what to look out for what are the pros looking for in any given moment have you interviewed them what have you ever asked the question what were you thinking in that moment when you flipped 180 and shot that tracer well I heard her footsteps behind me, so I knew she was coming. I didn't flip till later so that she'd use her second blink and thus be out of blinks so that I could flick her and take care of her. You know, he didn't just look right away. He heard it earlier. Do you have that level of game sense that a top-level player has, even though you might not have the reaction speed of that top-level player? So it's just very important things here when it comes to non-UI elements here. You've got a lot of stuff you can just study without even stepping foot into a cast or stepping foot into a game with that though talk about anything to add there uh nothing to add yeah some really really great points about that you know um i think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about playing overwatch more you will get these things down because you know obviously as casting it's important to you know hear about the diva denied you know the, the, the sleep darts we were talking about I mean, but i'll tell you it's way worse to have that happen while you're playing right <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And some of the audio cues are, are only audio cues. You mentioned Diva yeah. eating something, for example, that's using her defense matrix to capture a projectile ability. Usually it's when she captures an ultimate ability, she will say some kind of voice line. Sometimes it's specific to the character and sometimes it's more generalized. So if you hear her say, looks like your clock's off, that means she ate which ultimate FBI tugboat? 
The clock's off? Looks like your uh, clock's off. Oh, man, honestly, I don't know. She you put me on the spot here. She ate noon. In Nine noon, yeah, 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 yeah. not the right time. Or, yep. you know, if she eats uh, Soldier's Ultimate or his tactical visor, you know, she says something differently there. What it is, you're gonna have to go look it up now. Okay, yeah, it will get there you. You, go. you know, I'm not gonna go into all the details already. there. <laughs> yeah, but but some of them are more generalized, and she may interchange them. She might not always say "look like your clock's off." She might say her general voice line mm -hmm. for that. But that's just an example of the nuance that you can get from non-UI elements. Yep, and, and again, just uh, something you can definitely learn by by playing just yeah you know, a lot more. A anything that'll always help. Um, moving on here to the roles of casters. There are two main roles of casters. There's the play-by-play, -play, and that's what I've been doing. And there's the color caster. We'll get into some other kinds of casters later. What is play-by-play -play talk commentary? Play-by-play -play, play -play commentary is excited commentary based on who and what is happening as it is happening. Um, you're the hype man. Lots of times, you know, the color kind of has to bring you on, almost like bring you back down to earth because you're just freaking out at everything that's happening in there because they're the person to talk about why it's happening. So before the game starts, like you're in there, you know, uh, at the beginning of every match, there's different amounts of times, but teams set up, you know, attackers go in and, and just, you know, talk about what they want to do. Defenders set up, you know, determine their metas or determine their uh, team composition, excuse me, and then set up and go. Okay. So there's uh, not really any point in talking about the attacking team setup because they can change it within that first minute. I believe it's League of Legends and Dota where you cannot change your heroes after you go in. That is a big way that Overwatch is different. Okay. Um, as far as talking about defender setup, and generally as a play by play, this is something that you're going to follow your color commentator at. Okay. But uh, a good thing to talk about is map preferences. It's also, you know, team preferences and hero combinations. Uh, you know, a very, very popular one. Was the uh, was the the grab dragon combination? Of course, they changed the grab recently, but uh, and so not 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 nearly as popular now, but uh, but still something that is definitely worth calling. You know, and and their individual heroes they call for counters to that. You know, the old counter was the Zenyatta ultimate. So you know, the people would see this, and you can say, oh, you know, I, I would not be surprised if the attacking team sees the Zarya Hanzo combination and instantly goes with the Zenyatta. Moving forward here, let's see. So something you really want to go off of, you know, the most hype, the big plays, right? Um, but no, sorry, we'll go to engagements here. Sorry. This HX9, around. Um, the, what, what is an engagement? Engagement is when both teams are ready to engage with the other team, okay? So that, that's talking about positioning. It's talking about all kinds of other things. Um, this is where you'll be picking up the, uh, you'll be picking up from your color here, okay? And so don't talk over color. Because the big, you, know, you want to let them be able to throw to you right before then. Any good cast is a conversation. That's the one thing I want all of you guys to get from this class. Any good cast is supposed to be a hyped up conversation. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um. Yeah. And so then we're moving on to big plays. You know, dramatic big ultimates. These a lot of these are things like DPS ultimates, uh, damage per second ultimates, damage characters like Rip Tire, Genji Blade, Barrage. These are all things that are worth calling out. You know, as soon as they come, the Rip Tire is you know maybe a little bit longer, but all of those other ones, as long as they're going, the end of it is go is the goal of it at least is to get multiple kills on the other team. That's the, that's the meat. That's the meat and potatoes. That's what you want to be casting. Okay. Um, sniper headshots. Kind of talking about the first person shooters and stuff like this. Um, very, you know, those big skill shots are so important just in, and make for great play by play commentary. Um, of course, uh, Overwatch only has two snipers that are able of headshotting somebody and killing them instantly, and that's Widow and, and Hanzo, Widowmaker and Hanzo. Both of those extremely popular in the higher uh, levels. Um, and those shots are not, not easy to make. I'm not sure how much HX has, uh, has played some snipers, but I am not very good with it, and it feels great when I can when I land one. Oh yeah, um, I, I, I can only I play imagine. a lot of snipers there, Tugboat. <laughs> yeah, in between all my support playing, right? I think yeah, everyone yeah. En envies the snipers, though, don't you? At the end of the day, I wish I was able to flick, you know, flick it like <laughs> Linkser. Honestly, like it, I, I wish I could pull that pull that uh, grappling hook, go up, hit multiple headshots up in the air, um, and. Uh, yeah, well, actually, we, uh, I guess we'll be showing a short clip about uh, talking about, I guess, an Overwatch League team doing that um, here soon. So another uh, big, big, big play is things you want to pay attention to. Crowd control. 
It's the general idea of any ability movement that restricts the movement of another opposing team or, or, or a member of an enemy team, excuse me, uh, for any amount of time. So these are uh, s some ultimates like the Gravitron Surge from Zarya, the Shatter from Reinhardt, um, big boobs by one of the many, many characters that have uh, that have, the, have those abilities you're looking at, you know, uh, the Orisa Pole Grenade, you know, Lucio's boob, the Concussive Blast, like we talked about with Farah and stuff like this. These can be, these can result, uh, when people go off the side, of course, these can roll in instant, unresurrectable kills. You know, instant 600 damage on uh, on a road. You know, uh, uh, Winston just pulled his primal rage. If he gets booped off there without a jump, that's a thousand damage done. There's no healing. There's no packs that are going to help him. There's no nothing that's going to help him. You can't res from down there. There are definitive kills. Another thing you want to pay attention to is interrupted slash Eden slash deflected ultimates. We talked a bit about this with the Diva. Okay, these are huge potentials to get hype. To really get the crowd going. These are some of the most dramatic times in Overwatch, and sometimes they're often missed by casters. You know, HX put me on the spot here with the uh, not this time, you know, Diva, Diva, uh, uh, defense matrix stuff, but it's stuff like that can really set you apart from other casters uh, in being able to pick up on those cues. And and again, there's many ways to uh, many ways to get better at that. I would say that playing and practicing are the two definitive ways to get better at this. Okay. Let's see. Um, def and deflected. Uh, I guess that might be like a little bit, a little bit specific. But um, you know, Diva can eat ultimates. Genji, on the other hand, can deflect them. And of course, that makes him his own. That's those are very, very skillful Genji plays. Um, they require an insane amount of timing. There is not a more hyped moment in an Overwatch cast when a Genji deflects a Zarya grab for the you know to to make that his own and make the the team that originally shot out that grab. Now trapped in the gravitron, you know the, the 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 team deflecting did not do anything for that ultimate. You know they didn't they didn't do any damage, they didn't block any damage, they didn't do anything, they didn't heal blah blah for that ultimate, but they got it. That's huge. That is prime play by play material. Now, if there's no action though, you know these these are things these are big plays these are big things to talk about. If there is no action though, then just throw or give a prediction, a question. It has it can be something. Super small, you know. If you're about to head in overtime and all and one team is entirely dead, it can be a nice little prediction, like you know, HX, I, I sincerely, or HX, I sincerely doubt this team is going to be able to get on back there. Perfect That's throw. Absolutely right. They're not going to get back up there, tugboat, and that is because these many, many reasons that I'll cover in the color casting section. Mm -hmm. Good. Thing. And uh, so, yeah, basically, what I'm saying is, you don't want to describe what's happening just because you're a play by play. Okay. I'm going to go through some ways to throw. Uh, to your co-caster in a way that is not readily, you know, it's not readily apparent to people who are not casters, basically. Um, and all of these methods are good methods to use sparingly. You don't want to use any of these things a lot, right? Um, one of the things I actually developed with HX was using the time at the end, okay? So, you know, after that failed attack, we were looking at two minutes, 30 seconds left on the clock, okay? Another one is to throw with a very simple question, kind of like I was saying, you know, HX, what does Team A need to do to get through this choke on Anubis? You know, especially after, say, they've, uh, they've been trying to get through this one particular time and really preferring that for a while. Okay? Let's see. Um, another kind of direct throw of sort of like a, a mixture of what I said in the beginning was, you know, what do you make of that, HX? Just a really simple, easy question. Um, and another one that I do is an exclamation with a sort of, uh, you know, personal direction at the end. Oh, yeah. Okay, something and like... I, I'm sure there are uh, a bunch of other ones, too. we got to get to that when we get to the throwing section coming up. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk we'll talk more, way, way more about that, um, about concluding statements and, uh, and what a throw can look like. Um, again, just be sure not to hit on any of these because uh, pe people will notice, you know, eventually. Uh, moving on over to overtime. Breathing takes a back seat to overtime is a very popular play-by-play -play saying. And overtime, especially in Overwatch, is just a beautiful moment in a play-by-play -play life when you know that this is the end of the game, ults are going to come out, everyone is playing for the W, there are going to be people who live, there are going to be people who die. In many, many ways, this is a method of testing all of the best things about a play-by-play. -play. Okay? So we'll get into some of those things, some of the best things a play-by-play -play can be. All right? <clears throat> First and foremost, hype man. You got to get the people going. This is why the position exists. This is why the position has existed for years in other sports. 
Okay, it's why that you know every major traditional sports uh, sports league has a play by play caster. People want to know why. Uh, again, I guess going back to you know why the play by play position originally existed is because of radio. People couldn't see and they needed to know what was going on. Another good trait of a play by play is not talking over uh, your co caster and correctly directing in game conversation. Again, the after game is more the color territory, uh, the colors territory, or in the be in between game. They want to talk about how and why what happened just happened. Another good trait of a good play-by-play -play is commentating quickly and fluidly when necessary. A term in the business is rap godding sequences. You know, just uh, you know, sounding like an auctioneer for a second, right? Um, this is good for some parts, but a big problem is trying to do this too much, and we'll get to uh, uh, common mistakes by play-by-plays later. Rap godding is good in certain uh, sequences, and it is only good if you can do it fluidly. If you repeat yourself, if uh, if you give uh, those, that is not going to go well for your big, fast rap god sequence. The whole point is doing it fast and fluidly. Moving past mistakes quickly and uh, not correcting necessarily is another really, really good trait of a play-by-play. -play. In general, just not fixating on mistakes. You know, you're going actively, going for every single second. You know, this is uh, this is Overwatch and this is esports. We talk every single second. You want to watch baseball? Okay, they, they talk for 40% of the cast. That's not us. So talk about uh, the, so what's a necessary correction versus an unnecessary correction, okay? An unnecessary correction, I would say, is something like, you know, this trace, uh, this trace has got her ultimate when in reality she's closer to, like, you know, 90%. Um, Tracer in particular is, is a character that will generally dump her ultimate off by herself, maybe combo it sometimes, but it's an ultimate that can definitely be utilized by, you know, Tracer, already a diving character that doesn't always stick with her team. Um, and in 90 per second, especially Tracer is going to get that ultimate very quickly. It doesn't necessarily need to be corrected. Yes, you are objectively wrong. It doesn't matter. Okay. Something that you do need to correct, for example, is if you say the wrong team name. Okay. Kind of going back to what I was saying about the thing, people are listening uh, and, and not always like watching. They may not know exactly what uh, which team name which team is which. And if you say the wrong team name, oh, you know, uh, you know, th th this team is on attack, and they're going to have two minutes and thirty seconds. When in reality, it's the other team. That is really confusing to all your all your uh, all your watchers, all your viewers. That's why you're doing this. You know, um, that is something that is definitely required to to correct. You got to let people know. And you see, and, and as a caster, your voice and your and what you're saying needs to be golden needs to be, you know, the word of God. It needs to be the, everything there. You know, you are 100% correct. Everything that you say is, is, is truth, 100%. Um, and, and, and uh, but, and, and you need to correct yourself if, uh, if you, if you said it wrong, but, you know, something like that is objectively wrong can be very, very confusing. Another really good trait of a play-by-play -play is, uh, is funny and artistic phrasing. Something that I love doing that HX9 absolutely hates is the puns, the lame, lame puns, all kinds of things with water or, uh, or you know, uh, bosses or, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's fun. You know, people like listening to that stuff. People like laughing, you know, but at the same time, don't kill it. You don't want to overuse anything. Um, something I'm going to go ahead and mention here is a little tip and trick about phrasing and stuff like that, about names. Um, you know, a good caster asks for preferred pronouns before a cast. It is harder to do, yes. And the vast majority of time, people will just say, eh, you know, use the hero names. Whatever, you know, if they're, if they're playing Zarya, use she. If they're playing Hanzo, use he. It doesn't matter. Or very, also very frequently, the everybody that you're casting, all 12 people, will identify as a he and him. But people like being, being referred to as their preferred pronouns. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a polite thing to do, and good casters do this. Um, and, you know, just, just like that, you know, it might be easy to just always say he, him, but, you know, don't always take the easy road. Moving forward here, going on to the common mistakes that play-by-plays will do. Feed reading. Feed reading is the biggest cardinal sin that any play-by-play -play caster can commit. It is boring, and for anybody who doesn't know the term, it is you know the, the 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 kill feed is the thing in the top right that shows who has died and how. It is the worst thing that a can the play-by-play -play can do is be boring. There's nothing that screams. I am unprepared. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not comfortable casting, and I shouldn't be here, and I should have thrown 10 seconds ago, like just reading what happens via the kill feed. There are even some Overwatch League casters that practice casting with a piece of paper over the kill feed because they have found themselves getting to talk about the kill feed too much, especially now, you know, when Overwatch first came out, it was just a little, you know, frequently a little, uh, little sword symbol or something like that when somebody died, right? 
Now you're getting all kinds of things. Now you're getting abilities. Now you're getting, oh, well, you know, you finish it up with a hook and all this other stuff. Now it's red when there's a headshot. Okay. There's a lot of information there and there's a lot of information you can use, but just reading off that information is boring. Okay. Moving forward, talking too much is a common mistake. I do this in my, I do this in life as is. I'm a talker. It'll uh, frequently kind of come with the next with buying, trying to be too casual or trying to be too funny. But, um, and, and this also might come from, you know, developing the hot hand, you know, liking a pun that you made, really liking your rap god sequence you just came through, you know, having something funny that you just said and you want to make another joke on it. You know, having a good joke that everybody, you know, that was funny, people laughed at, whatever else, and that you wanted to continue on to, okay? You know, just know, just know when, to, uh, when, when, when to leave a joke when it is, because at the end of the day, and again, a cast is supposed to be a conversation. Uh, another common, <clears throat> excuse me, another common uh, mistake here is being too casual or trying to be too funny. You know, again, kind of ties in with the previous one. Uh, maintain a balance. Know, know your audience and fulfill expectations by the, organ the, by the Discord organization or whatever organization you're casting for, uh, you know, that, 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 that they've laid out for you. You know, if it's a fun, jokey cast, you know, I, I've done a lot of those, almost like radio DJing, then that's cool. You know, um, just you know, say say the funny stuff that you want. It doesn't have to be super on point and stuff like that. But if you're trying to do something serious, you know, if, if it's a you know, professional level, uh, you know, production quality stuff where teams are trying to get into the next level or trying to play for some cash, then it's reasonable for them to expect you to not, you know, be jokey, to not kill the same jokes, uh, you know, stuff like that. Another cardinal sin of play-by-plays is repeating words. And of course, this comes from not being prepared. Not being prepared is a general uh, root cause of all these problems. Repeating words also happens when you speak too fast or you're trying to buy yourself time to think when you should be throwing or you should be wrapping what you're saying and using something to throw. Um, got anything to add there, Bob? Ray checks, sorry. Oh, well, you might have noticed that the kill feed wasn't on my diagrams for what UI elements you have available to you. It's almost oh, like that it's was super, uh... intentional. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the kill feed is a tool, and it is something you should use, but it's something that definitely shouldn't be overstated. And you can actually turn it off in-game as opposed to just covering it up with some kind of silly... A uh, piece of paper or something. Don't don't, don't be like those guys, folks. Mm -hmm. Be better than those guys. Just turn it off in game if you want to practice mm -hmm. that way. Cool, cool. I think uh, 50 minutes in, we're going to take a short break. Be back in about five minutes. Everybody, you know, get your uh, get your drinks. Use the restroom. We'll see you in just a second.
Welcome back everyone. We are here again with the introduction to Overwatch casting part two. If you're just joining us, uh, just introduce a little bit of introductions here once again, briefly. We won't repeat ourselves, but uh, I'm HX9 here, Bob, you can call me. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of things with casting, of course, and I'm joined here by Tugboat here, another seasoned a veteran caster in the tier three scene. Hey, hey, oh. And, uh, you know, we are here just to talk a little bit on the second half here. If you missed the first half, you can go back and watch on Twitch, of course, in the video link on this channel. Or you can watch this on YouTube a little bit later. We'll be posting the video uh, 24 hours from the end of the cast. That's Twitch's rules. So, you know, if you wanted it sooner on YouTube, I'm sorry. I can't do it. <laughs> I'd be breaking my contract. So, can't do it, Captain. <laughs> with that uh we're gonna jump right into the next section uh as we're going on though uh, i would like to field one of the questions there that was asked and that was how necessary is pen and paper and uh you know mm -hmm. i would say it's certainly not a requirement i don't think that that tool is necessarily the, the thing you're going to always need but uh, some benefits to it would be especially getting a bigger picture it can be very difficult over the course of a four-hour casting session to remember what happened in the first game and maybe you want to reference yep. something like unlike this unlike this other team from before this team has better engagements you know the my old old choir teacher used to say the sharpest mind is still duller than the dullest pencil so write things down because hmm. it will remember things better than even the best mind because it's always there so even if you're not using a pen and paper maybe instead use some kind of online tool you could use epic pen to take notes if you wanted to or you could take notes on a second screen again we talked about having better equipment having two monitors you could have a second screen to take those notes on as well great answer great answer i i, I use pen and paper for every single one of my casts um, I just find it easier to to remember, honestly. Um, and, and there is science behind the fact that blue ink will help you remember what you have written better. That is, that is uh, you know, proof science. Oh, yeah, I bet you it's like five percent better. I'm I'm not buying yeah. it. I, I need to I need to cite your <laughs> sources here, talk about it. We're gonna need to see the proof here. Uh, okay. All right, but you know, whether it's true or hocus pocus, yeah, go get a blue pen. Sure. I've got blue pen right here on my desk, actually. I've got a black pen. You get one of those. You get one of those little pens that has like nine different colors on it. You get like black when you're feeling hx 9s advice, blue when you're feeling eight. If you got tugboat's yeah, advice, if you want to feel enraged, you write in red. No. There you go. Exactly. All right. <laughs> With that though, we'll jump into color casting, and again, pertaining specifically to Overwatch a little bit, as well as uh, just some general stuff about it. Color casting is, of course, the reason for what happened. It's the color added to the black and white picture of what happened during the cast so it's a direction or the result of what the play-by-play -play was talking so basically you're breaking it down for people you're you're telling them what's going on so a couple things specific to overwatch is when does color casting actually happen well in other sports it happens between plays and remember in games like football or american football uh, or in soccer and, and in hockey and in some other times there are times where a color caster can come in between plays there's some very specific rules around it but with overwatch those rules are a little bit further between so sneaking in your color casting is very difficult sometimes so one place you really shine is before the game and between the rounds before the game you know you get to break down what you expect to see based on all that experience and knowledge that we talked about before so if you've watched all of Overwatch League and you've seen King's Row and you know that GOATS is the comp that they're running. GOATS being, of course, based on your knowledge, Reinhardt, Zarya, Diva, sometimes Roadhog, and Lucio, Brigida, and either Moira or Ana. It's going to be one of those two breakdowns. Then there you go. You, you know that's going to happen. And now you can talk to the audience about why that is. They like going through the hotel. It's actually very quick to point. The Goats doesn't have great range, but there isn't a whole lot of long range uh, areas for people to hold on King's Row. But Widowmaker can still be strong because of the high ground against it. So you can describe different ways that uh, that is going to break down. And then once they come out there, you can say, well, and it doesn't look like they did that. You know, they went with this other strategy, and here's the reason why I think they did that. So we, I mentioned the word why a lot. We say why a lot, but it's the who, where, when, why, how, but much less of the what. Now, 
you are going to be describing some what's because you have to frame what you're saying. You can't just say sleep dart. You know, well, that's, that's, yeah, okay. But what, what sleep dart? Okay. Sleep or the sleep dart, dart onto <laughs> Lucio or the sleep dart that hit the Genji inside the Alderworth Hotel caused him to be taken out of the fight. And during that five seconds, he was unable to use his dragon blade. His Ana was killed. And thus the nano boost was not available. When he finally came out in dragon blade, it was too late. Everyone else was dead. That might not have even been picked up by play-by-play -play casting because, well, he wasn't looking in the Alderworth Hotel at the time, but you were, you knew it was going to happen because that Ana was getting pummeled earlier in the game and you took note of that. So now you're giving a little premise as to what happened, yes, but the what occurred because of it, the, the occurrence afterwards or the reason that things happened, the why they lost the point is described by you later on. That's the color casting's job. So you're during those engagements, you're taking notes, you're planning what to say at the end. So it's very easy for a color commentator in terms of knowing what to say. It's just how you're going to actually project it. That's the difficulty. And uh, we're going to jump into that in the next card here, which is the best traits of a color caster. Your extensive game knowledge helps you determine what you're going to say. And you want to be able to explain that to the average viewer, not the lowest common denominator viewer. You're not going to go something like, well, Genji, who uses throwing stars to do his attacks, is going to attack <laughs> with those throwing stars. His left click will shoot three of them straight ahead. His right click will shoot uh, three in a spread of three and fire slightly faster. That's too much. OK, that's breaking it down to someone who knows nothing about Overwatch. That's not your necessarily, but sometimes might be your target audience. You want to break it down for your audience in a better way. You might say Genji dashed in there and used his quick damage to hit some headshots onto an Ana. OK, headshot, that's something people should know about Overwatch in general. But on the other side of things, you also don't want to get too technical about it as well. You don't want to be too breaking it down too much. And you don't want to get too technical. So, for example, using the word CC. I don't know how many of you know what CC is. And uh, if I said that, do you know what that means? Do you know what aggro means? These are general terms from other games, but not necessarily carrying over to Overwatch very well. Aggro, of course, being an aggressive play, a team that is very aggressive aggro aggressive haha <laughs> no it's, it just turns into aggro because uh it's a long story cc is crowd control and overwatch does have a lot of crowd control but it's not always described as such in overwatch i hear very few people calling it that so it's not necessarily one that's really transferred over to that community your viewers aren't going to know what cc means so you might have to say crowd control which is a general term Riot teams use that in police forces. Crowd control methods are using, you know, fire hoses to break, uh, break people down or using big uh, big shields, uh, riot shields, in fact, to stop crowds from getting into certain areas. So crowd control is a general human term that works pretty well. But you might not use more advanced terms like, uh, you know, one that I like to use that I think is maybe going a bit too far or pushing the boundary is ingress. The ingress of something is when they engage into someone. It's using a thesaur big thesaurus words. Whoa. Those aren't always appropriate either. So be very careful uh, what your language is and, and base it around what the fans want to see there. I, that's one of the most important things, I think, for color caster. More than anything else, break it down. But color casters do have a number of pitfalls that they fall into, and one of those is being monotone. And that is because color casting is not during the hype sessions of the match. It's not where the action's actually taking place. But it does not mean that that action was less hype, okay? It does not mean that that sleep dart on that Genji inside the Alderworth Hotel was not that exciting. It was very exciting, and you should be very excited about that sleep dart that landed, even though it was so quick and very minor. And you're going to bring it down a little bit, too, from that hype as well sometimes, but sometimes you're going to be just as hype, because that extra bit of excitement keeps people engaged. You don't want to lose people between the engagements. There is always exciting stuff about overwatch to talk about but not everything is so don't fall into the trap of talking in monotone which is of course doing something like this where you're just going to describe exactly what happened and it's very difficult for me to do this because i'm not really used to it because i've practiced so much to avoid doing this okay yeah that was hard okay Whew, i can get that out of my head i'm gonna go have to cast a, a subway station like tugboat here but um uh, you know get it out of my system yeah, I, we were joking about, we had a, 
we had an analyst the other day who wasn't very very hype and i told him you know you go go make an order at like chipotle and just be a big caster on that one you know <laughs> yeah i'd like to get a steak burrito steak of course being the meat that comes from cows and causes a great Blank deal of, of carbon emissions so <laughs> and, you know, something like that you know doing those ridiculous things actually does help get it out of your system uh, another thing is getting yeah. too technical. We spoke about that, but also stop the what. I, I got to say, there's so many times where color casters go in there and just re-describe what happened. You can't just say, mm -hmm. your, your play-by-play -play caster might come in and go, and Reinhardt gets a massive shatter hitting five targets. They're all knocked down, and everyone's coming in and sweeping them up there. They're going to clean up the point, and they throw to you. And suddenly you're in there and you're going, well, Reinhardt there got an earth shatter on five <laughs> targets. And that allowed them to capture the point. Well, yeah, but what? Why did he get that Earth Shatter? Was it because the shield was down? Did Brigida come in there get a shield bash on that other Reinhardt and protect the shield? Were they not even running a shield that could block that? Were they just positioned all in the low ground? Were they fanned into the low ground because there was a McCree high nooning off on the side there, and they all ran out of his line of sight but into the Reinhardts? You know, there's all these reasons that that could have happened, and that's what you got to go for. Not the Reinhardt got an Earth. Shatter. Are we we know that if our play-by-play -play was doing their job you know with tugboat here i know he's doing his job so i don't have to do that but with other casters Aww. maybe i maybe i do need to go into the what you got to be a little bit careful sometimes mm -hmm. finally since we got to get we want to speed this up a little bit let's see we're getting a little bit shorter on the clock than i was expecting uh, and that is uh, other types of casting hybrid casting is where both players do both color and play-by-play -play. you might immediately jump into the next one and throws get pretty complicated with that because you might not know when a throw is coming to you so you have to treat it like a normal conversation uh, normal tone of conversation. A play-by-play -play caster might talk a little bit about color because the color ran out of things to say and then jump right into the play-by-play. -play. He might finish halfway through the play-by-play -play and have the color tone jump into it. Not a lot of people do this, but it's really good in overtime if you are, as a color caster, able to pick up from your play-by-play. -play. Sometimes they set time limits. If, if a play -by uh, overtime is going for a minute, play-by-play -play might just throw right to you. He might get tired or might run out of breath. You can pick up, take a little bit of play-by-play -play from him, and then pass it right back to him relatively quickly. So he gets maybe 5, 10, 15 seconds to breathe there. So that's a place where you can hybridize your casting and not just take those two jobs. Solo casting is something you might end up doing. That's when you just do it all. Just one thing to note on that one, don't forget to breathe. You know, you don't have to fill every moment of time with just you. It actually doesn't work out that well. So be sure to leave some space. Finally, VODs. And you're going to be doing one of these a little bit later. Uh, and that is oftentimes used for auditions. People want to see an example of your work, use a VOD. Because first, and I'm not going to tell anyone you did this, but you could watch the mm -hmm. VOD first, take some notes down, and then you could cast off of those notes. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe you, should, maybe you should be doing that at some point. You know, But if you want to put mm -hmm. your best, best showing forward, use all the tools available. Guarantee other people in the industry are doing this already. So don't feel like there's some big ethical conundrum there where, well, they're not getting the real me. Well, if they want the real you, mm -hmm. they can get a VOD that you recorded live. They can specifically request that. So, yeah. don't. We're not going to go into ethics today. Now, we want to talk about throwing. So I'm going to throw it right yeah. back to you, <laughs> yeah. FBI. Not today. No, no ethics today. The only thing I wanted to add to that, that you did touch on is that in overtime, especially if, you know, the color has to take over, you got to keep the hype up. You know, as, as, in overtime in general, like I was saying there, you know, that is the last part of a game. People are dying. People are dropping ults. Nobody wants to die with their ultimate. You know, you got to keep it hype up. But let's talk about throwing, throwing in game, play by play throws to the color when engagements end. When, what, is, what does that mean? What does an engagement ending mean? Um, this comes in many different times based on many different things like ultimate economy. Ultimate economy is another great thing that you can use as a play by play to talk about when you might want to regain your footing. Um, but generally an engagement can be said to have ended when say two, if two of one role, say two tanks, two support, two, two DPSs are taken out on a team or definitively when three people have died on a team outside of two CP, of course, two CP attackers goal is to kill all the defenders and continue on. Um, but generally two or three people dying is, is about the time that you want to start to throw to your color. Okay. So a color throws to a play-by-play -play before engagement's in. You, they want to give your play-by-play -play a few seconds to frame it. You say, okay, this team's coming right on here. They're going to be flanking. They have one person flanking around. The other five are going gunning right down the middle. You know, that's a perfect time to set up a big team fight by, like for, you know, for a play-by-play. -play. And otherwise, just maintain a natural conversation. We talked about some of the ways in which you can throw earlier that, uh, that, that, that make it seem more natural instead of just stop talking because that's the worst throw on the planet because then the person isn't going to know to pick up. 
It's going to result in you two talking over each other. Okay. We're going to talk about some reasons for throwing too late. Um, but by the play-by-play, -play, if a team is re-engaging quickly, you may need to throw before the fight is truly over, but not too soon. You know, and this comes along with being a being a play-by-play -play caster and noticing, you know, say the ultimate of the con. Okay, so I, I kind of going back to what I was saying a few seconds ago. You know, say uh, say a damage and an off support are dead in the team, but they have the Anna and the Genji blade up. That team fight is not over. That is one of the most common combinations between supports and damage uh, ultimates in the game. And a, and a good Dana boosted Genji can be the stuff of nightmares that can completely flip around team fights. And you don't want to end that too soon. Um, cut for colors. Uh, a little common reason throwing too late is, is uh, not condensing your, your complex game knowledge. Or, or you, you, not condensing that uh, is a reason for throwing too late. Condensing it uh, is what you want to do. You want to uh, get kind of like HX was saying, you know, use good words that, you know, elaborate on what you're saying, but you don't want to use, you know, too big a long words. You don't want to use words that people are going to have to look up afterwards to understand what you meant at, you know, 25 minutes and 31 seconds. Okay. So moving forward, here's some common reasons for throwing too early uh, play by play. Uh, and, and this is on, this is the same for both. You have a lack of game knowledge or preparation. You don't know when an engagement is truly ending or you're running out of things to say. And it's the exact same for a color. You're, you have a lack of game knowledge or you're not prepared enough or you're not, or, or the third big thing being you're not comfortable with your co-caster. This is something that just comes with time, but people throw too early because they don't know when engagement is beginning, they're unprepared or they do not have enough game knowledge about this. You know, um, I'm, some games move very quickly. You're, you're, you're an observer, you're, you're a caster. You need to be able to keep up with all of that. So some difficulties with the voice over internet protocol. Okay, so basically just thing, uh, uh, things that, uh, uh, problems that arise when you talk over the internet. I guess it's an easy way to say that. You know, it is a conversation, but you're not sitting. Looks like we uh, lost FBI there. But yeah, it's a conversation and you're not sitting across from someone. So you're not going to get that body language. And that body language is incredibly important in normal conversations. Some say that body language is more than 50% of a conversation. So uh, you got to be very careful about, you know, when you actually are picking up from someone you, and you have to be careful about how you talk and how you throw between people. Also, you might get echoes, you might hear background sounds, and of course, uh, you might have some bad habits that kind of carry over with the internet that you're not used to. So for example, you might maybe be used to uh, talking very frequently over the internet or having your voice mic, your mic open or not holding your push to talk button down. And some of those habits are different. I use push to talk when I'm talking on stream. That way my mic is always muted, but I'm not always using push to talk when I'm using voice over IP. So yeah, it's very, uh, very bit of a tricky, uh, a tricky piece to that there. Also, another thing about throwing is to make sure you know you learn about piggybacking, you know, and that's just piggybacking on to other people, and, uh, you know, with your other caster. So if you're going to piggyback with someone, make sure you go off of what they're saying. It's, you can't just be in isolation from one another. So if they're talking about that and they throw you a question, you got to answer the question or you got to talk a little bit about that. Or if they're talking a little bit about a really hype player or some specific person, you might want to bring them up again or you might want to introduce that conversation. So you got to work with each other in order to do that. Cooperative conversation. Are you back yeah, with me? Yeah, yeah. Cooperative okay, conversation. There you go. We like the alliteration here. Um, I, I, sorry about that, but we're back now. Piggybacking. I think that's what we were talking about, right, Ashex? Yep, I pretty much covered it. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, just, uh, you know, the, the act of wanting to hype up without without taking over, without wanting to interrupt. Um, something I'm going to get to here is just about swearing. Uh, don't do it, basically. This is Overwatch. It's not Gears of War. You're not sawing people in half. The character's not screaming obscenities. Don't do it. You know, an errant D word when somebody lands a really good headshot will not nix you from casting for all of time, but just don't swear. And, and, and everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say that. Um, I believe this is towards the end. We're going to be getting on in here with Jaws after the break. Is that correct, HX? Yeah, before we do that, we probably want to field any specific questions that anyone has here. This is a good probably time so. to ask if we missed anything and you want to do that. So why don't we collect questions during our break while we get Jaws out here, and we'll maybe pose some of them to them and him and some of them to us after that. 
All right, with that, go to a quick break here as we get Jaws on deck. So, yeah, again, if we missed anything, throw the question out there in the Twitch chat. Be back in about five mm -hmm. minutes. And we are back. Last little bit of this casting class. And joining us this time is Jaws, the wild man on the mic, UK contenders caster. Jaws, how are we doing tonight? Yeah, doing pretty well, man. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank oh, you. 
We appreciate you coming. We appreciate you coming. And of course, we still have HX9 with us. HX, you with us? <laughs> For sure. So we'll get right into it. Uh, but and first, do a little background. Um, Jaws, you just want to talk to talk to us a little bit about yourself. Just kind of introduce yourself. Yeah, so I am a play-by-play -play caster from the UK, although now that <laughs> the role is a little bit more fluid, I think, in Overwatch, but originally mm -hmm. started out as a play-by-play -play caster in League of Legends. I've done games such as uh, League of Legends, Vainglory. I've done a little bit of Hearthstone before, um, obviously Overwatch now. And yeah, I finished uni a few years ago and decided I didn't want to program anymore, so I was thinking what new career that i wanted to pick up and it turned out i enjoy casting and here we are today here you go beautiful so uh i think you may have answered that but first game played league of legends um first game played yeah uh, what, no, no, I guess you said, yeah no no sorry uh we'll, we'll go with the old history what was the first game you ever played jaws first thing you remember <laughs> playing putting hands to hands to console uh, controller keyboard um don't actually. It probably it probably was Pokemon Red. <laughs> my my first. I've never actually thought about my first ever game that I played. What? But it must have been Pokemon Red. Huh. Uh, I'm, I'm 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 and I'm surprised. I I uh I was kind of going for some like kind of general questions there. But Pokemon Red. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. That was the first game I ever played. Original... <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was like one of the first uh, one of the first three, I believe. But okay, okay. What is the first game that you play on a competitive level now? I think we said. It was uh, no, it was actually Halo uh, back yes. on console. So yes. I played Halo 2, an absolute, well, Halo 1 and 2, an absolute ton. Halo 2, I only touched the multiplayer like a little bit, like online multiplayer. We used to have lands around a friend's mm -hmm. house like a lot of the time. That's where my like wanting to be very competitive kind of stems from, I think. Wanted to beat all my friends, and I did. Uh, <laughs> so that was really nice. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was the best in the friendship group at the time, which was cool. And then as soon as... Kind of, we found out about Xbox Live. We moved on to that, and uh, I didn't originally have an Xbox for myself until a little bit later on. So we, I used to go around to friends, and we used to take it in turns, kind of thing, map by map. Mm -hmm. And then Halo Three was probably when I first started actually getting into competitive. Like I played ranked a lot, like rank, uh, ranked MLG playlist, like an absolute ton. And then that stemmed into like COD Four. And then when I got my first PC, I started playing Pro Mod on uh, on COD Four. And then TF Two was my first. Like well, I'd say COD Four was my first like tournament level experience, mm -hmm. um, and then Black Ops Two also I completed on that, and I was top fifty in EU on the rank ladder at one point. So that mm -hmm. was kind of cool. That was in uni as well, and then Team Fortress Two was also on the sidelines as well. I was a scout player for um, uh, a Div Five, a Division Five team. So we went like amazing, but that is definitely where a lot of my I want to be playing in tournaments kind of came from, and then finding that I wasn't the best player in the world you know I, it, it was just more of a casual thing especially at uni as so i had a lot of work to do and then friend introduced, to, introduced me to league of legends and that's where i started to be in casting i casted league for a while and then overwatch kind of fit the perfect niche for me where not even niche mm. sorry but perfect um perfect game category for me where it was an fps but it was like a team-based shooter like tf2 was so it filled that gap in my heart as tf2 uh isn't dead but like you know it's not as big as it used to be and now we're here. I enjoy casting and I enjoy playing Overwatch at uh, like a decent level. And it's, yeah, it's all good. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Uh, time time uh, takes a toll on all of us, right? Uh, you talking about Halo 2 and Halo 3 really got me, you know, you know nostalgic. The, land, the, yeah. the, the oh, days yeah. of the land, the days of the land, man. It was so simple. No, uh, no connection issues and just playing and talking crap to your friends right to their face. Was, uh, yeah, exactly. That was, the, that was the best times. It was a beautiful times, man. We took them for granted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so you knew you wanted to be a shoutcaster, uh, playing League of Legends. Yeah, League yeah, League. it was, uh, yeah, it was League that really okay. started me all off. Although my first casting, I say casting in like air quotes, was actually Hearthstone <laughs> when uh, the game first came out, and me and a friend who got knocked out in the first round, me, uh, he got knocked out, and then I was doing it solo for the first game and did his, and then I was just like, "Do you want to like come on and talk about the game on the stream?" Mm -hmm. And it was for a university tournament that I set up, and. That was technically my first ever cast with me and yeah. a friend just sitting on, you know, um, was it Skype? Yeah, it must have been Skype or TeamSpeak, um, just talking oh. about the game on stream. So yeah, that was my first technical cast. And then I decided I really liked it. And what game was I playing? League of Legends. And I just sought out small organizations I could cast. There you go. 
there you go yeah uh the rest is history i guess as they say that's Pretty interesting much. i feel like uh i feel like a lot of i mean i i know i for sure like i mentioned earlier just you know always kind of had an interest in it and just said screw it one day and did it you know that's kind of that's uh that's interesting yeah. um hearthstone too that's what's up, that's what's up. <laughs> uh, it, was new, it was the new hotness you know it came out and everybody was playing it so why yeah, not yeah, yeah. another another blizzard giant another blizzard yeah, giant exactly. uh, i used to play a uh I used to play, we'll just say a lot of Magic the Gathering. We'll just uh, leave, oh, that, yeah. leave oh, that one there. I did start at uni, but it's kind of an expensive hobby. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me. Those those pieces, little, what, I think it's two and a half by three inch pieces of cardboard can uh, can uh, take, a, take a man over. <laughs> I, yeah. I used to love Magic the Gathering. Anyway, moving forward, can you talk to me a bit about your experiences on EU Contenders? Uh, you know, favorite teams to cast? Who were you most, uh, what was the most excited match and the best match that you casted? Um. Yeah, I mean, my fate. Uh, it's so hard to pick. Um, <laughs> I can I imagine think, with the competitiveness yeah. in the EU scene. Yeah, EU is kind of a monster when it comes to like raw talent. You know, it's kind of hard mm -hmm. to actually pick out an individual team that I'd enjoy casting. Like, and all the personalities also, which uh, a lot of people don't <laughs> see obviously because it's not like uh, Al, where you have like promotional videos and the teams mm -hmm. doing their own content and stuff, but like. Uh, just meeting the players out loud and stuff and just like knowing them from online and talking to them and even playing with them sometimes it's uh you, you, you sometimes not biased but like you definitely have your favorite kind of players that you, you enjoy interacting with um, yeah, yeah, yeah. i would say probably giganti is probably one of my favorite teams to yes. cast just because i don't know they're just so good they're just so mm -hmm. they're, there's their ability to like set play uh you you set plays to uh set rck out with a bomb for example is um obviously one of the big things that was happening in season one the rck bomb even season two where uh it, it, when shadow joined the team and nil uh ended up retiring i think giganti mm. was easily the most explosive team when they came out onto the field you know something big was going to happen somewhere during the series or like somewhere just during the map you know something crazy was going to go off and more or less it was an rck bomb or in season two it was a uh genji blade from shadow or something so I'd say they were probably one of my favorites, although it is very, very hard to pick because there was just so many exciting teams and individual players as well um, in the roster of uh, all the teams. I, I got you. I got you. And, and, and not a bad answer that uh, it's hard to pick, right? Super exciting stuff. And again, yeah. a very, very competitive scene over there uh, in Indio. Um, and this, uh, this might be a super obvious question, but uh, who would you say is the cast that you're most in sync with? You know, um, casting most with. <laughs> well, obviously nowadays it's going to be leg day, but uh, <laughs> I've had a few casting partners over over the I don't know two years that I've been casting now. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's uh, it's has to, it's very time. Yeah, it's super easy. Like it's it's leg day because <laughs> that's the only partner I have right now for uh, casting Overwatch. But yeah, um, yeah. I will be casting with other people a little later on, um, just on small things, not anything like massive. But obviously, mm -hmm. me and Leg Day are a, a package when it comes to casters right now. As Blizzard, like everybody to be, you know, you got the Uber X is a is a package. Obviously, Monty yeah. and Zoa, a legendary package from back in the day, and carrying that legacy on, you know, it's a me and Harry are now a a package caster do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, kind of like I mentioned earlier, very very important, uh, almost as important as you know, knowing the game itself is being comfortable with your caster, right? Uh, you know, yeah. no, having synergy, knowing when you're knowing when you're casting, knowing when you're not talking over the other person, and instead piggybacking. You know, knowing that they're not going to take that as you interrupting them and then stop talking. You know, stuff like that. Very, very important, and nothing that you can get outside of practice, right? Yep, true, very true. There you go. So, um, right now, do you cast any other games? Uh, not right now. I'm I'm just focusing on Overwatch at this current time. Uh, mm -hmm. I might be doing like. A small PUBG thing for for Newell in the UK um, at some point, but like nothing massive. Uh, Overwatch is definitely I like to concentrate on one thing at a time <laughs> when it comes to games. Although I am open to casting other things because we are allowed to during the off season. However, Overwatch I just I know I love the game too much and I like casting it too much to kind of focus anything else. You know, I'm not going to go straight from contenders into like another gig that lasts a month that we have off. You know, I'd rather have downtime and rather create content and stream and, and, and do all that kind of stuff around mm. Overwatch because that is just the game um, I'm in love with right now. No, no, no that, absolutely. Don't want to cheat on, uh, don't want to cheat on all Overwatch and Blizzard <laughs> and, uh, you know, all that. Um, so last question here, uh, just any tips and tricks, you know, you kind of wish you'd known when you were starting out that maybe, you know, you learned by some trial by fire, you know, something that you just wish that every caster knew that would just make the experience a lot easier. 
Um, yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a couple. Um, this is uh, one of them, which is quite, it's, it's fairly hard when you're starting out because you'll be switching partners like mm-hmm. all the time because that's just the nature of uh, being like an amateur when you start out, right? But getting to know your partner is really important and sitting down with them and discussing a cast and being critical of each other, um, not necessarily during the cast, although I sometimes come off a cast and, and say like, oh man, that was really bad. I did this wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we should do this, you know, in the next game. Uh, when I when I talk to Harry, like as soon as we finish a map, um, you don't have to be that, you don't have to be straight away critical about that, but like being critical of each other is 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 super important. If Harry doesn't like something I'm doing or I've done something wrong, then he'll tell me, and I don't mind him mm-hmm. telling me straight away. Like after a game, and we're about to go, we've got like a five minute break, and we'll go into another one. Like I don't mind if he tells me then because I can instantly create correct it. I know some people don't like that, and they'd rather just continue the entire broadcast, finish, and then go review it later. But being critical of your partner is fairly important, just so you can both improve as a, as a product and just um, improve as your. Uh, as an individual too mm-hmm. um another thing definitely would be don't be afraid of talking to people that are up the the metaphorical ladder so to speak so when i first started casting one of the first things that was kind of dr- not drilled into me but it was mentioned to me that there, there is a ladder when it comes to casting like uh, the uh, the tippy top for example in owl it's like and sorry no watch is a little bit easier because you literally have products so you've got owl at the very top so all the cast is there and then you've got um contenders um below you although there obviously will be subsets of so achilles and wolf for example like they're good friends like i ask them about um casting advice all the time uh, they, they're more more experienced than me and then you've got um like for example people doing trials like broadcast gg and whatnot make sure you're talking to the people above you about what you could be doing better and just asking for VOD reviews and just getting to know those kind of people as well. Cause it's super important at the end of the day, you're all in the same field. Um, regardless of what game you're casting, you're going to be all in the same field where you can always accept feedback and crit- criticism, you know? So I'll give it like a long term example. Like I, I knew Achilles before Overwatch. Um, I asked him for VOD reviews like a long time ago. Um, I'm sorry. You knew who? Achilles. Achilles, got you. Sorry, you yeah, said that yeah, so fast. I didn't understand. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Achilles, yeah. So I knew him like a long time ago before Overwatch. Um, I, I knew him during Le- my League of Legends time when I was doing that. And I did challenge series in League of Legends and I got him to review some of those. And I ended up uh, casting a Vainglory event over in Singapore and then went to Korea oh. and just um, ended up meeting him face to face first time after a few like VOD reviews and kind of, um, you know, getting to know him. And like, we're, we're good friends now. And it kind of, it, kind of swings around about so we ended up working together in the Incheon stuff in Korea which was great and I still go to him for advice and he, mm. he's still very willing to kind of hand that out so make sure you're making these kind of um, contacts with people because it is super important when it comes to a career in like a talent career you know when you, when you are talent because mm-hmm. one day you might be working with people but at the same time you you got to make sure that you're improving also so speaking to people that are better than you and higher up this like metaphorical ladder like i talked about is extremely important because they're going to have advice and wisdom that you don't necessarily know maybe you're doing something wrong that you're not realizing they're going to be able to spot things that you aren't spotting in your own vod reviews so mm-hmm. that would definitely be my big tip and uh, don't be afraid to reach out to people either um i d- like I definitely was to start off with, but luckily I've got good friends in the UK or now some of them, you know, moved to Berlin actually, um, who just kind of helped me out a lot of the time and just told me all this stuff, which is uh, just astronomically helpful. But if if it wasn't for them, uh, people like Medic and Excoundrel, like I wouldn't know what to do at this current time when it comes to like asking people and like, you know, not being afraid to approach people and ask for VOD reviews or questions, you know. So yeah, that would definitely be my one uh, bit of advice for brand new casters. Yeah, absolutely. So take kind of the idea of like, don't be scared of marketing yourself, right? Um, and I, and yeah, I feel like... In a way, way, like, I wouldn't say marketing yourself, but like, just honestly, just uh, just to go to yeah. someone for improvement. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Just like, ask them, you know, am I doing this correctly in a cast? Am I um am i handing off correctly to my color cast or to my play by play when should i be mm-hmm. speaking here do you know those kind of questions you know like maybe something you're not entirely sure of just ask someone that has more experience than you because that's how you learn at the end of the day okay okay so uh don't be scared of constructive criticism by any means yeah right? for sure yeah don't be, yeah don't be scared at all no cool okay okay cool um yeah that, that that was awesome did you have anything else that you wanted to add jaws 
Um, not particularly. Obviously, watch Contender Season Three. Yeah, That's coming up very ask. soon. <laughs> I was going to ask about any shout outs, uh, any organizations, or obviously contenders, right? Yeah, yeah, contenders. Make sure you're watching the Contender Season Three. It's going to be crazy considering all of the people that might get picked up for owl there might be a lot of free spots uh, in terms of teams so i'm i'm super excited because the owl signing window is still open so Ooh. anybody from any team right now can be picked up so new slots will have to be filled so there's going to be plenty of fresh talent and it will be um hopefully a fresh new season with a lot of players moving up because there is just so much cra- well so there are so many crazy players in eu that needs to be picked up yeah. by our teams honestly yeah, uh, Europe getting their second uh, their second owl team in Paris. Uh, you know the league going from what twelve to twenty teams now. Not yep. a better, not a not a better, more exciting time to be a to start being a shoutcaster, y'all. So <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and open it up for any questions for me, HX9 or Jaws. I would really, really uh, advise you guys to ask Jaws questions while you have them. You might have even mentioned you know asking people who are higher up the letter. Uh, you know at at, at this point, you know. Uh, to you guys. So, any other questions? We can go ahead and field. I'm checking Twitch chat now. Uh, going from the top here. Cool. Take them over. All right. So, first one we got here. How much should we worry about the free cam? I know it's been difficult for Owl sometimes, but how can we as casters work around it, or should we get good enough at using it? So. From a amateur casting perspective, you should be pretty familiar with using the free cam. It's not actually too difficult to use for the casting purposes. Remember, you're not going to be the one showing your screen in a lot of cases. So uh, in some cases, maybe you do end up doing a little bit of production side where it's kind of out of the scope of what we're talking about today. So just get familiar with some of the hotkeys and stuff for it. Uh, shouldn't take you more than a couple, you know, a couple times doing that for what you need to do it for. Uh, player name pronunciation tips. This one, I'll take a little bit of this one too. Uh, for this one, just uh, be sure to ask questions. And remember that just typing out letters a lot of times doesn't give you the good perspective. For example, if you type the letter E, it could mean E, E, E. It can be a schwa. It can be a soft E, hard E, long vowel, short vowel. Those don't really help. Plus, players come from many different geographical backgrounds. Keep in mind, for example, in Italian, I-E is pronounced E, E-I is pronounced I. So, you know, those little things, you might not know what the background of the player is. So you probably want to get some specifics unless it looks like it's normal English. And even then, sometimes that can get crazy. Uh, Best to just ask, as for Korean names, you should be able to pronounce some of those too, but you can look those up. Korean is a phonetic language, so. Honestly, I like, but my best advice when it comes to player names, uh, if I just quickly interject, sure. is just ask the player how to mm-hmm. say it. Yep. Either like ask him on voice, like I don't do, I don't ask them on voice unless um, I, I know the player well, but more often than not, if you just ask them and then just write it out phonetically. So there's a player called uh, Spoxes, and it looks like Spox, but it's like Spoxes um in uh, contenders so just like ask them that's the best way you're going to do it and if they say like oh you could just shorten it to you know i don't know for example uh spock says spock like if you just wanted to be called that like mm-hmm. then that's fine you could go with that kind of thing so honestly just ask the um uh ask the player and t- in terms of like korean uh letters i would Again, try and ask them if they know English. Um, you are correct, though, in the way that Korean is like fairly easy to read an alphabet. So that's also pretty easy. But if you really get stuck in the middle of games, because I know it's incredibly hard sometimes to look at a player name and then go, oh, sh- oh no, I need to like translate it real quick. You know, you have to think of the words because um, Hangul is actually fairly easy to pick up. But, you know, I'm learning it right now and my brain isn't so quick, I feel, and it takes me a long time to kind of pick up characters. So you could just say the hero name. So if it's like a Korean Doomfist player, just call him Doomfist. Um, if, if, you know, in the moment or if it's uh, you're struggling to try and find the word for him. Oh, oh good. You're, you're learning uh, learning Korean here, Josh. That's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's really good to hear. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Annyeong Haseyo and, uh, uh, and all that jazz. Yeah, there you go. There. Yeah, Annyeong Haseyo, yeah. yeah. Cool. All cool. right. Well, well, we'll have to do a traditional Korean sign off here at the end. But uh, <laughs> uh, sure. let's see what else we got. Uh, can the color tester discuss what went wrong in a team fight, or does the fight have to, after the fight has been done? Yeah, that's typically when you'll do it between engagements. Remember, you know, uh, the engagements, the, the fights that are going on can be of varying lengths, and you might get it thrown to you even before the entire team has been cleared out. 
once you get that once you get that throw or that handoff from the other caster, just pick it up and go. Uh, so that's not a very complicated one. Let's go to another one. Uh, if you're not part of an organization or crew of casters, would uh, would be uploading casted vods be the best thing? So should you just upload casted vods to be, for exposure? In terms of getting exposure, that's an interesting one. Uh, Jaws, do you want to field that one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, when it comes to not finding an org, like honestly, there are a ton for every game. So on it, just spend like 20 minutes Googling it and just seeing what you can kind of come up with. Um, when it like for obviously Overwatch, the obvious one is Broadcast GG, right? Um, but for games like League of Legends, PUBG, like there will be small orgs that need casters at some point, and if they don't have casters or they don't stream their games, just ask them. Like ask an admin, uh, or if you can ask the tournament organizer, like, hey, can I stream your games? And then all it takes is them giving you an IGN, for example, of a player. You join their lobby, and then you spectate the game, and then you cast from there. Um, and making sure you're uh, as much as it is kind of frustrating doing it on your like finding a partner um, to kind of do it with you, I would highly recommend it. Solo vo solo vods, uh, not the best way to show what a person can really do as a caster. So if you can find a friend to cast with, that's like a thousand times better than doing it on your own, honestly. But yeah, upload vods. At the end of the day, you're going to need them at some point. So yeah, absolutely. And you can always try to use a couple little tricks there down use the twitch downloader to get vods there's some twitch downloading apps that you're not really supposed to use but if you download some other orgs uh, vods put them unlisted on youtube you're going to avoid the copyright protection issues because some some organizations don't upload vods and twitch will deletes them after so often so that's one thing you might have to do yeah the solo vods don't use those as showcase jaws kind of mentioned that we talked a little about solo casting sometimes you'll do that because the organization will have no other way for you to you know shorter yeah you want to keep that, your and goals. that's fine yeah. but um if you can find a partner it's better um if you're trying to like show off your work especially especially when it comes to i'm going to take overwatch and league for example an example if you're a play-by-play -play, you could honestly you could do what i do which is like go through a vod go to a t overwatch is a little bit more difficult because the pacing is a little bit more off but like league of legends is kind of a perfect example for this in the way that there's a lot of downtime then there's a fight like it's super easy because you go okay the color's going to talk through this and then the fight's going to happen the play-by-play -play is going to do it so you can easily as a play-by-play -play, you can go through the vod pick out the fight talk over the fight overwatch you can do the same thing there'll be bits in the fights and whatnot you're going to have to hand over because maybe it's too long but you can kind of judge that for yourself but you can do the same thing you can literally go back to world cup vods like our vods whatever cast over the team fights if you're a play-by-play -play, and then stop and then you go to the next team fight do it do it do it, do it uh, if you see what i mean if you're going to do it solo, that is obviously. All right, we got one more question for specifically directed to you, Jaws, here. And that is, sure. um, from what you've experienced, how do the streamer slash production teams grow up the ladder and get recognized? So what kind of experience do the streamer's production team uh, you work with have? So it uh, looks like they're, they're more focusing it on uh, not so much the caster part of it, but the other folks you're going to be working with. Yeah, so um, production is obviously a little bit more difficult to spot because you're not on camera or you're not like on the mic or whatever, but it is very evident if you're doing a good job or not. Um, production, like you can always notice when production goes bad, but very little time if you're not looking for it, you go, wow, that's an insane production because that's not the main focus. The main focus is the cast. But if the production is going smoothly, then no one's going to talk about it, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. That's actually a pretty good thing because you're clearly doing a good job and everything's going um everything is going well yeah. um it's again just kind of getting yourself out there talking to other people and people like uh, tasha from broadcast gg i know her from newell in the uk which is a national university esports league she's like a crazy good producer and she is getting there she is doing broadcast gg i asked her if she could do an event in london with me at the end of the month which she's doing which is really good and it's doing these small events and making connections through either meeting other people in production or casters or people that can recommend you to other organizations. It's, it's kind of the same thing with casting, except you're not, you know, you're not visibly showing what, or low, sorry, uh, you're not like speaking over a VOD, right? Or like um, an actual game, you're, you're behind the scenes and whatnot. And people will notice if you're doing a good job. So I wouldn't worry about that. It's just, again, just n knowing the right people, talking to the right people, asking for advice uh, from other producers. And yeah, just having evidence that you've done it, which is fairly evident if you've uh, run a few tournaments that, you, you know, you can say, oh, look, I did this. It was 
really good we did uh this cool free cam thing straight into a uh like a team fight and camera work is obviously a big important factor of games like overwatch so you're going to get noticed if you do a good job and yeah just making sure you're talking to the right people again it's kind of the same advice as advice if i were to give it to a caster too yeah yeah all right so we're going to go ahead and close questions um, we're running a little bit a little bit long here, but what we're going to go ahead and do is the last part of this class. Jaws, really appreciate it. Again, um, so we move yeah, on no to worries. pairings, uh, the play-by-play in colors. If you would like to be paired off with another member of this of the class, please put your name and what role you believe that you would prefer into the Twitch, and we will get you paired up. Have you cast a ten minute about a ten minute clip here, sir, that we have from uh, some of the World Cup actually recently, and uh, and then you guys are going to send that to us for us to review over the next week. When you have that bot up, so just uh, mute the announcers, do yourself a short little intro, and then just get right into it, okay? We're not looking for perfection here. We're looking for things that we can, you know, mention and, uh, and, and improve upon. And if you have seen this game uh, and you, like, you know, you remember the outcome and stuff, just message me and I'll send you another one to do. And, we'll, and again, we'll have that done in about a week, depending on the number of entries. Um, the last thing I want to do for you all is this. Um, some of you uh, may be ready to do your first Overwatch cast and then later, if you, you know, so choose to. Within the next day or so, there will be a channel open on the Way of the Tug channel for one of the you know, 20 or plus Discord organizations that I've worked with and other people I've worked with who can post casting opportunities in there, and there will be a whole wide range of organizations that you guys can choose from so that once you feel like you're ready, you can apply to these organizations, and then you can get on, go get on in a cast in a scrim night or something like that. And there's all kinds of things for all, you know, all, all, all different uh, – all different SRs, all different uh, types of people and everything. Uh, Outlet is another one that is one that I've worked with a lot who does, uh, they only do Diamond Below games. Um, Overtime Champions is a massive Discord organization, but also have a PS4 and Xbox side if that's what you need to stick for for now. You know, PCs are expensive and stuff. I've had problems with that myself. Um, Death Blossoms Friends and All Ladies League were super nice and let me cast for them when I wasn't the greatest and maybe a great outlet um, for anybody who, uh, who is a lady or one to only work with some super, super nice people. Um, just all great outlets, and in the end, I just want you guys to succeed. And if you want to succeed with me, cool, and, I, and I'll be able to provide you with some of those casting opportunities. And if not, I hope that this class is, uh, has given you some insight on Hana, how to cast. And I hope that you guys fall in love with it just as much as I, Jaws, and HX have. And uh, just a little quick tutorial here. Someone asked earlier, how do you set up something so that you can see? So <laughs> we're going to go super risky mode here, and I'm going to show you OBS. Uh, this is the OBS Studio. And you can actually see on screen right now what Obstery looks like. Uh, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to add a scene to this here. And uh, that scene would be a browser. No, not that. A window capture. And you're going to grab your... And you're going to see all my open screens here. But uh, you're going to grab your window mm -hmm. here. I got Chrome open. This is the cast that we're going to be having you do. And once you put that on there, you're actually going to see uh, that window... Uh, show up on your screen and then you can just hit play and cast over that uh, you can do the full screen you can play around with it a little bit but it's just going to show exactly that window you can see in the top part of your screen it's pretty small i understand but i'll transition on screen so that'll put it right there on screen for you mm -hmm. and that can help you out uh, quite a bit into getting that on screen then when you hit the record button you know play around with the ob settings set them up you're going to want to be a little familiar with this because someone else mentioned in chat in the chat also that sometimes you might get asked to produce something from your point of view and no one's going to be looking for expert camera point of view but that might open up opportunities for you if uh if you wanted to cast someone's event and they didn't have a producer so uh yeah this is how you do a vod recording here and back to you tugboat yeah, uh, that, that's pretty much all I got. I just want to go ahead and send along the link. I will go ahead and put that in the channel, in the Discord channel, because it seems that I cannot do that in a Twitch chat, which makes a lot of sense. Right now, we have... Oh, there you go. Never mind. People who are more able than myself are able to do that. Alk battery, color, uh, Jurassic Park color, Rexark color. Okay, so what we're going to do here, Rexark, I know that we have cast before. So what I'm going to do is pair off Alk and Jurassic Park and leave this open for another 60 seconds or so if anybody wants to pipe up and join away. Obviously, if you already have your, uh, your partner that you want to uh, cast for, you don't, no, need to, uh, no need to pipe up. Uh, I'm sure there's some AGN people who might prefer to continue to work with other players that they have casted with before. Um, and then I say, okay. But if anybody else wants to be paired up and have your, uh, your VOD reviewed, then go ahead and hit the Twitch chat right now or in the next 30 seconds or so. Um, 
and again, I just want to thank Jaws, thank uh, HX9 for doing this with me, and shout out one more time, Erskine College, great place up in Greenville, South Carolina, offering the, uh, you know, the only place, only college in South Carolina, at least, that is offering esports scholarships uh, and, and pretty substantial ones as well. And uh, they are in partnership with Virtual Reload, an esports coaching center in Greenville, South Carolina. Both great. And EGN, I want to again thank you guys for coming on out. A bunch of Rainbow Six and League of Legends casters, I believe. And a specific shout out to Jared Kaiser for, uh, for helping me, helping me, uh, you know, make the class and stuff. He is a teacher himself and has given me a lot of advice on how to cast and or how to teach casting here, you know, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, looks like we're not going to have anybody else, I think, in the in Twitch chat. So, Alk Battery, Jurassic Park, you guys go ahead. Rexark, I will follow up with you in a little bit. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Once again, I'm FBI Tugboat. This has been your Overwatch intro casting class. And with me, as always, Oh, you're supposed to say my name after that, Tug, but HX9 <laughs> here. And uh, yeah, be sure to, uh, again, uh, we'll post our social medias in the chat for Twitch chat and in the casting class Discord. So I'm not going to bore you with that. We're signing off, though, from the stream. We'll see you in the casting chat in the Discord channel.